This episode of Keys to the Shop is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Whether it's espresso machines, manual brewing devices, or general coffee shop needs, they seek to pursue the most innovative coffee products, both domestic and abroad, to offer their customers. Find out more at prima-coffee.com. This is Keys to the Shop, episode number 25, Mastering the Art of Training with Dave Stahoviak. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop. I'm excited that you decided to join us today. My name is Chris DeFerio, and I'm your host. Uh, this podcast that you're listening to right now is dedicated to giving you insights, inspiration, and the tools that you need to grow as a coffee service professional. And today is no exception to that. In fact, I think you're going to find a lot of value of today's conversation talking about mastering the art of training. All of us in the industry at some point in our career are going to experience that moment when we are given the responsibility of training somebody else and bringing them up to speed. So either you're unofficially training somebody who's new on the bar and somebody asks you to bring them up to speed, or you're officially a trainer, and that's your position. You're an educator at a coffee bar or roastery, and you need to know how to train people better. Maybe you know how to do your your, uh, job as a barista, like you know the craft really well, but maybe you're not so confident in the educational aspect of it. Uh, There is a big difference, and we talk a little bit about that in the beginning, between knowing how to do a job and being good at communicating and educating people, uh, training them on that job. So today I'm honored to bring in an expert in training, coaching, and leadership, Dave Stahoviak. Dave is the host and founder of Coaching for Leaders, a top 10 careers podcast on iTunes that's downloaded over 200,000 times every month. Coaching for Leaders was recently selected by Inc. Magazine as one of the 12 podcasts that will make you a better leader. And Dave was also listed as one of the 25 professional networking experts to watch by Forbes in 2015. Dave is also the facilitator of the Coaching for Leaders Academy, which is an exclusive year-long leadership development experience with an intimate group of participant leaders. And he believes that leaders aren't born they're made. And virtually anyone can learn the skills and attitudes to lead others effectively. I'm fortunate as I've been a fan of Dave's podcast over the years and gotten a chance to sit down and talk with him uh, a a year or so ago in Coffee Fest in um, Anaheim. I was able to have lunch with him and, you know, pick his brain about leadership and podcasting before this podcast was even started. And I'm honored to call him a friend and also somebody who I look up to in terms of his example of leadership. And also his podcast has great topics and great guests. Uh, Dave's wisdom and uh, insights have been instrumental in helping me become a better professional. And today uh, he lays out for us five key things that we need to be doing as educators and trainers that'll help us master the art of training Each one of these things builds on the other so that both you and the one you're training are more successful at the end. So without further ado, let's just dive into the episode and the conversation with Dave Stahoviak on Mastering the Art of Training. Dave Stahoviak of Coaching for Leaders and Innovate Learning, welcome to the show. Really happy to have you on. Hey, Chris, I'm so glad to be here. Thanks so much for the invitation. Oh, absolutely. Um, You know, I would say you're one of my podcasting heroes. I got to know your work a couple of years ago, um, just looking for good resources for leadership development and, you know, being in a management position, you know, always looking for things to uh, uh, make myself better. And when I found your Coaching for Leaders podcast, um, I think the best way to describe what I thought about it was that I had just discovered like this band that was so great that I just kind of looked around like, does anybody else know that this is here? Like I'm, I'm just discovering this. This is a really amazing, uh, relevant, well curated content here. So man, thanks so much for the work you do. Oh, you're welcome. I'm, I'm really honored by that. And, uh, I've really, uh, 
really appreciate the opportunity to get to know you over the last year or so. And it was so much fun having you on Coaching for Leaders as well. And I hope uh, your, audi- your audience will uh, check out our conversation about managing part-time staff because you just did a fabulous job. So uh, it uh, it was something that I heard a lot from my audience uh, that folks really appreciate it. So thanks so much for that perspective too. Oh, absolutely. It was an honor to be on there. And um, you know, one of the things that uh, I really get from your work is this thread. It's your tagline, leaders aren't born, they're made. And uh, I resonate with that particularly because, you know, one of the first jobs that I had was uh, something that required me to kind of become a leader and not that I thought I was born a leader, but I became a trainer in a coffee bar. And I, I did so because I was, well, I was made a trainer because I was good at my job. Um, right. And we're going to get into some pillars, kind of some keys for how trainers like can really uh, approach the people they're training and the job itself and really thrive and do well. But I, w- I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the difference between knowing how to do a job like I did, I was good at coffee, I was good at espresso, and knowing how to train somebody to do that job. They're not the same thing, are they? They're not the same thing at all. And this comes right back to what you were just saying about leaders aren't born, they're made. And it's one of the reasons it's a tagline for my show is I struggled through this a lot when I started leading people. And like you, I was pretty good at being an individual contributor. And all of a sudden, when I got into a role where I had to lead people and manage and make tough decisions. I found that I really struggled with that a lot and it is an entirely different skill set. And what's really, I think takes a lot of us off guard is that it looks similar. You often go to the same place. You're wearing the same uniform. If you're in uniform, contextually things don't seem that much different. And yet the kind of things you need to do as a leader are often very different of the, and than the things you do as an individual contributor. And I had to learn that the hard way. And I think that's true for most people. I, I'm sure there are some people out there that make that transition very seamlessly. Most of the people I work with, though, it's just not the case. And it certainly wasn't the case for me. It's, it's really something we do have to learn how to do well because it is a really different skill set. What, what in particular is different about that skill set from your own experience? What was that aha moment once you became a uh, went from an individual contributor to somebody who is supervising or, or leading? The first leadership job I had was when I was in college. This is going back now, probably 20 some years ago. And uh, like you, Chris, I mean, I, I like to think that I did my job pretty well. So I was the individual contributor for a while and for a year I had worked this job And then all of a sudden I was in a position where I was managing about 20 other student employees um, and a a full team of 40 people. So it was a really big jump right away. Yeah. And I just assumed that everyone would do the job as well as I did, or at least close to it. And I realized pretty quickly that not everyone just does what they're supposed to do. You know, you have expectations for what what the work's supposed to be. Everyone hears those expectations. Everyone gets the same training. And yet, curiously, not everybody follows the process exactly the way they should. I know, I know. Curiously, people have different personalities and um, don't always like the way you communicate with them versus the way someone else does. And I remember um, I had a employee at the time who taught me a lot because him and I were really different. And I don't even remember what the conflict was at the time. Um, and conflict may even be a strong word for it. But um, I, I remember him telling me at some point near the end of my tenure of this, you know, pro- of this program we were running together, he said, you know, the thing I really want for you is just to tell me what you're thinking and to be direct. And that was not a skill set I had. I, I'll say today, even that's something that I struggle with a bit. And so I had to learn that skill set. And I realized very quickly that because I wasn't able to do that, I wasn't able to be direct and I wasn't able to um, connect with him how he wanted me to communicate with him. I lost a lot of credibility with him. And it it's something that was a really good lesson for me at the time, because I realized that even though I was really good at doing the individual work, I wasn't doing a great job at coaching people and meeting people where they where they are. 
or where they were. And so I think that's a really important skill that a lot of us need to learn when we get into a role where we're teaching, or leading or coaching or whatever the situation may be. Man, that must have been, um, it must have been frustrating to see that opportunity kind of pass because you can't go back and change the past. But the people that you led and managed in the future had the benefit of your experience. Indeed. And I learned a lot early on. And as difficult as that was, it taught me a lot about how to work with people and, and how to do better. And it, it turns out that this is something that's really common for a lot of us when we start to lead. In fact, it's so common it's uh, it, there's a related term to this in the in the management literature called the Peter principle, which is that people are promoted to their level of incompetence. And the, <laughs> the reason that that happens is because um, in most organizations, I think I can fairly say most the person a management opportunity opens up and the obvious choice is to hire the person into that role or, or promote that person into the management role. Who's the best job at the being the individual contributor on the team? Does the best job at running the store? Uh, does the best job at um, producing numbers in a sales organization? And they get moved into the leadership role. And it turns out that it's a lot different job for most people. And it also turns out not only do you shoot yourself in the foot that way, but you've also then taken away the person who was the top performer on the team doing what they do best for the organization. So all of a sudden you've got a person who's in a leadership role who's all of a sudden having to do a very new skill set that they're not accustomed to. And then you're also missing that person from what they were doing really well before in the individual contributor role. And that's a real challenge for a lot of leaders is navigating that and a lot of organizations too. And so it's not the same skill set. Coaching, training, facilitating, listening, the kinds of things that leaders need to do every day is not the same thing as being an individual contributor. There are some people that do both well naturally, but I haven't run into many of them in my career, uh, maybe just a handful. And it, it is it is a jump. It's a different skill set. When we talk about uh, shooting yourself in the foot from the perspective of somebody who is making a individual contributor, let's say in the coffee world, you're a barista who's really good at your job on the bar you are promoted. You don't want to say no to your boss because it seems like a, a good opportunity. So I think like the, there's, it takes two to tango in this case. Like one, it looks like the kind of job that you want and there's not many places to go in the industry, uh, in this industry, besides, you know, being an educator or being a manager. Um, and I imagine the same thing is true in other organizations. Like going up means getting more distant from the work sometimes. What are some things just uh, in terms of the mentality of somebody who's approached by a boss when they're saying, you know, we want you to be a trainer? How can they think of it in a healthy way before they just jump on that? That's a really good question. And I think that it's incumbent upon us as leaders, first of all, to determine if someone would really be successful in that role and if they're going to enjoy that. Um, because like you said, it, it's so easy to say yes um, to that opportunity. There's the assumption for most of us that if we've got the opportunity to move up, we should. Mm -hmm. In fact, this, this is reminding me of a conversation I had just last night with a client, Chris, uh, who has been a manager for a couple of years in a very large organization. and she's gotten to the point where she realized she doesn't actually want to be a manager. She doesn't like the management responsibilities. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it, it looked like at the time a good career move, but she found out that, that the skill set of the things she needs to do as a manager are not things she really enjoys. And she's actually taken a step back and kudos to her organization. They're actually allowing her to step back and be an individual contributor again, where she's going to be really happy and actually perform better. Um, but I think a lot of us fall into that kind of that sudden knee jerk reaction of like, okay, oh, I, here's this opportunity. I should take it. And it's good for my career. Um, so I think it's incumbent upon us from a leadership standpoint to make sure that we, to the best we can realistically explain what someone's going to be moving into and what that's, how that's going to change their job and their role and their skill set and what they're going to need to learn. But then I think if you're the person who's being asked, um, I think there's also a responsibility to ask some of those questions of how is this going to change my job? What kinds of things am I going to be doing now that I'm not, I'm, that I haven't done before? And also what do I really like that I'm doing now that I may not get a chance to do nearly as much. Um, and oftentimes, even though you're in the same place, 
the leadership job and the training job is very different from that. And so I think asking some questions up front is really helpful to figure out if it's the right move. And it, and it's, I think it's okay to say no. I mean, there's a, I, I was under the impression, Chris, earlier in my career, when I, I've been in the training industry for almost 20 years now, I was under the impression that everyone should move up. Everyone wanted to be a manager. And, and I realized really quickly uh, in talking with people that that's not the case. And it, there's nothing wrong with being an individual contributor. In fact, if you've got someone who's a strong contributor in your organization and loves what they're doing and doesn't have an interest in moving up, I think it's a real mistake to to strongly encourage or even force them to move into a role that they may not be ready for. Because then again, you shoot yourself in the foot twice uh, and you have an employee then that isn't very engaged in the new opportunity. And you really want someone who's ready for that and is ready for that challenge and that opportunity. Very well said. And I am just kicking myself as I'm listening to you because I'm remembering people that I have uh, have been great as uh, baristas and through my career in coffee, I've uh, you know promoted to a position where I needed that position filled. And there was, you know, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, well, it would also be good for them too. And we could both get what we want out of it. And I bet you that mentality that a, a boss would have uh, about like kind of uh, It's like whack-a-mole with a business where, you know, one need pops up. So you take this person, you put them there and it it just kind of sabotages their success. And I definitely have done that at least once or twice with people that just move themselves out of management once they were moved in because I didn't do my job properly of preparing them for what that meant. Yeah. And you're not the only one, Chris. I've done it too. And so many people I know have, have, have had that happen to them. And I think one of the things that we can do, maybe this is going off on a little bit of a tangent, but if we have the opportunity in our organization to reframe how we look at positions as not uh, this is better or worse or, you know, being a leader or a trainer or whatever the position is, 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 is better or it's the expected path, but that there's multiple paths to be successful in the organization and I work with an organ client organization right now that has two different tracks for success as far as career. One is the management path, but then there's also a technical track. And so you can be an individual contributor and continue to move up in the organization by by position name and still be compensated um, a- as much or if not almost as much as the folks who get to the executive leadership level. Um, by demonstrating real value to the organization as an individual contributor. And I think that it's worth sometimes reframing just how we position the different roles in our organization and thinking about, you know, do I really want to set up the position as general manager or system manager, whatever the, whatever the role is as the all powerful endpoint to a person's career? Because for some people that's the right place to go. And we absolutely need people in those roles. But for a lot of people, that may not be the right role and it may not be something they want to do. And, you know, we'll talk about how to get better at that, of course, in this conversation. But uh, but I think that's that's really worth spending some time thinking about up front and just how your organization is framing those opportunities for advancement. So speaking of reframing or framing the opportunity or the job, uh, there's a particular set of skills that you need to have as a trainer if you're going to get the most out of being a trainer and from our correspondence and, and what we've talked about, you and I, uh, one of the first things that you need to do is you need to take a serious look at, at how to prepare yourself for training other people. It's not, you know, again, like you said earlier, training people doesn't necessarily, it's not the most easy thing. People aren't going to respond to your leadership um, as well as you might think they would. But this is something you deal with a lot with your clients and your own business. Can you tell us more about how somebody who is in this position now, however they got there, can uh, teach skills effectively, how they can prepare to teach others? Yeah, there's so many different things, but I think one of the things to start from is just to think about what's the outcome that you'd want. So let me give an example of that. Uh, years ago, I worked for, started my career working for a company that was a subsidiary of the Washington Post company. And we would, one of the things we would train people on as managers of uh, locations is we train people on inventory. 
and how to manage inventory, but we'd also teach them how to order office supplies. That was a big thing we had to do every month because we went through a lot of office supplies. It was an education center and we worked with kids. And so we would teach people how to do that. I got trained initially and, you know, you taught someone how to go online and order, do the staples order and get the book and the whole bit, you know, the big catalog. And so everyone learned how to do this in the company. There was kind of a standard process and procedure for doing it. And everyone got savvy on how to use the technology and how to put in the orders and what the data had to be in on and how the form had to be filled out and all those things. And I remember it was about a year or two into working for the company that all of a sudden this big memo came out and someone had discovered that as a division of the company, we were spending five times more on office supplies than any other division of the Washington Post company. <laughs> and, and, and this is a company that uses a lot of office supplies, right? Or runs a newspaper. And so it was kind of embarrassing for organization at the time. And what turned out is that all these people were going on and looking at catalogs and figuring out these great office supplies they could order for their different locations. But no one had ever had a conversation about the outcome that was really wanted is part of managing inventory well and ordering supplies is making sure you're cost effective. Well, that conversation was never had, believe it or not, in the ordering process. The process was all about logistics. What do you do logistically in order to submit orders and where do you spend time and how do you fill out the forms and all those kinds of things. But the the big reason for why you would manage inventory was missed, which is you want to manage resources really well and manage budgets really well. So you're choosing things that are going to work well, but also aren't the premium items if you don't need that. And within months, we save tons and tons of money in the, in the company just by changing that mindset. So I think one of the things that we need to go into when we're thinking about training someone is what is the outcome that we want? Because it's easy to get caught up in the, here's what this needs to look at. Here's the way I do it. Here's step four. And all of those things are important. We're going to get into that. At the beginning stages, though, we want to frame what's the outcome. What's the outcome we want from teaching this person this skill or this process or this procedure? Ultimately, what do we want them to be able to produce or do for the organization or for the customer that's going to add value? So I think that that's key. The other thing, too, is just to be realistic with time. And, and this is where being good at your previous job, if you if you become a trainer, Chris, becomes hard because oftentimes if you're training someone else to do something, you're at least reasonably good at it, if not one of the best people at it in your organization. And it's easy to forget that here you are, the maybe the person who's best in the organization at doing this, now teaching to someone who, who's never seen it before. And so as quick as you can do it and as comfortably as you can do it, it is really difficult often for that person to do it at the same speed and the same cadence and with the same confidence level you do. So you need to you need to allow for a lot more time than you think it's going to take. And so rule of thumb for me is if I think it's going to take 30 minutes, I'll double it and schedule 60 because I know that I'm not allowing for the things I don't think about because I'm really good at this. I'm not allowing for the questions. I'm not allowing for going through the process two or three or four times that I don't think about when I'm doing this for the first time because I do it so naturally. You know, it's like riding a bike. Once you get on a bike, you don't think about riding it anymore. But if you've never done it, it's a really difficult thing to do without extra time and coaching. When you say that, I think about the word just, you know, in quotes, just do this or just do that as in it, dim it diminishes the uh, difficulty of of the task for the person that's just learning it. So uh, I, what I hear you saying is like there's this you have to empathize with where this person is coming from, even if you forgot what it was like to be that learner who is really awkward and, uh, you know, knocking things over. You know, I, when I became a trainer, it was maybe some somewhat of an ego trip for me to like blow people away with all sorts of information about the process, about little details and how hard this job actually is. And, and I think I just really jangled people's nerves by doing that rather than bringing them along as a leader. And, you know, it, it would take a certain self-knowledge, I think, to know that I need to slow down and give people more time to absorb the stuff that I take for granted. You've said something there, Chris, which I think is critical for all of us who are training and teaching, which is we need to learn 
at least remember what it's like to be a novice or student at something. And I think one of the best things we can do is to be constantly learning something new that we're not comfortable with if we are a trainer or a teacher or a leader in any in, in any capacity. And so about a year or two ago, I picked up guitar again, partially because I wanted to remember what it's like to really, really struggle with something because it doesn't come naturally to me. It's not easy. I'm still at the beginning stages learning guitar and it's painful, literally and figuratively, when I pick up a guitar <laughs> to do something. And it reminds me of how hard I watch someone like play guitar who's masterful at it. I think to myself like, wow, that looks so easy. But it reminds me of how hard it is to learn something for the first time. So I think that's one of the key things we can do as coaches and trainers is if we can empathize with where a person's at and remember what that's like, if not for that skill, at least something else we're learning in our lives or maybe even not in the workplace, but we're trying for the first time. It really helps us to appreciate how difficult that is. And I think it gives us the empathy to be able to then stop and to slow down and to meet someone where they are and to repeat the steps four or five or six times and to not do what you were saying, Chris, which is go really quickly or try to impress them and all the things that a lot of us tend to naturally do when we become trainers for the first time, but to really take that step back and say, Hey, this person is struggling with this, just like I'm struggling right now with learning guitar. <laughs> How can I meet them where they are? And then together work with them to take them a little bit further. That's excellent advice. And I just wonder what instruments everyone's going to pick up after listening to this episode. Um, <laughs> so. Guitar is great. You know, guitar Guitar is an instrument you can learn to play really quickly uh, at something simple. But it's also one of the hardest to master, which is one of the reasons that I've loved utilizing guitar with yours. Because there's, there's, wherever you are, there's somewhere that it's going to challenge you to push you further. Oh, absolutely. And I, I am a guitar player myself and, um, not of any repute, you know, but, um, just for my own entertainment now, but I remember just the, the lessons being taught some trainers, uh, some guitar instructors were way more patient than others. And the ones that were patient and allowed me to be a slow learner, or sometimes I think of myself that way are the ones who really got through to me and uh, the people that we train are also of different types of uh, learning capacities. And so maybe we think our job is on the line if we don't get these people whipped into shape because we only have so many, so much time to train them. But I, I suppose a little done well is better than a lot done poorly. A little done well is way better than a lot done poorly or even a lot done mediocrely. <laughs> if mediocrely is a word, yeah. it's uh, it, it, small steps, Absolutely. small steps in the learning process. Um, and and that, that's something that is really, I think, helpful for us all to remember, too. I, I've had Marshall Goldsmith on my show before. He's probably the top executive coach in the world. And he talks about how he works with CEOs of large Fortune 500 companies. And one of the things that he talks about in his writings and his books and his, his interviews is that when he's working with someone at that level, they're working on one thing, maybe two. That's it. Because it's really hard to change human behavior. And if you try to do seven or eight or nine things at once, it just gets watered down and you don't end up making an impact. And so there's a reason that when we all learn how to play sports as kids, like we learn soccer, or we learn tennis or baseball or whatever it is that coaches focus on one skill at a time. They do a clinic on, you know, we're just going to practice today how to, uh, how to line up the baseball with the bat. And today we're just going to practice how to, how to catch, the, catch the ball in the glove. Uh, one step at a time, one thing at a time, and that is way more successful than trying to do everything all at once. I love that. I love this. And it's not just because I, I feel like I learned better that way. I think if we apply that as an industry and in, in the coffee industry, we can definitely bring up more future leaders, more future entrepreneurs. And just from the times when we, we either make them hate their job when we train them or make them love it when we uh, do all those things that we we're just talking about. So now that we're ready to train somebody and we've got the right mentality, it's time to like actually get involved in d the doing of the thing. And demonstration is one of the next things that are critical for a trainer to be able to 
uh, master if they're going to really bring people up well. Before you mentioned that we want to go into the step-by-step and the minutia, the process, but it sounds like we want to, from what you said, do the demonstration of the um, end product and the way it looks in the wild first so that they know what the goal is rather than uh, thinking about just the minutia as the goal, like the step-by-steps. Can you explain more about that? Indeed. So my daughter is three years old and she was talking this morning about what she wanted to do today uh, when we were hanging out. And she said, Daddy, I want to play Connect Four. And I was thinking about that in the context of this conversation, because uh, the whole goal, I mean, the whole goal of that game, of course, is to get four dots to line up, right? Either diagonally or vertically or horizontally. And when you see that game for the first time and when she saw it for the first time, she, like the question is like, well, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> What's the goal <laughs> of this game? And any good game is like that. If you get a board game out, the first thing you do is you look at the instructions and start thinking like, OK, what's the object of the game? What's the end result that you want to get in order to win? And that's really important when teaching someone how to do something. So you can start going through the steps and the process and procedure for how to do something. But I, I think that's really hard if someone doesn't have the context of what the end game looks like. Where are they actually going? What is this? How does this all look once I put everything together? So say, for example, Chris, you're teaching someone how to how to put together a latte for the first time. You know, maybe they've never done that. And rather than starting at step one and then explaining step two and explaining step three, first of all, show them how it how the whole thing goes. So you, from start to finish. You show them exactly what it looks like, maybe even do it in real time speed, how you would do it. And then they have the context of like, okay, here's what I'm about to learn. So they can see what the end game looks like. Then once you've done that, then you can break it down and maybe you do the demo again and you slow it down substantially, but that way they know where they're going. And when they know where they're going, then they can frame the context of the, okay, what are the steps I need to get there? Just like I was working with Hannah this morning on where, you know, you know, you need to get four in a row, you make different decisions about how you then utilize the pieces and the strategy you use along the way. If you don't know what you're doing, then you don't know where you're going. It's, it's the same reason why it always seems when you go somewhere new for the first time, it always seems like the trip home is faster (laughs) than the trip there because you have the context of knowing where you're going. And that's really important when teaching someone for the first time, because without that context, they don't have a sense of the full process that they're going to be seeing and learning and needing to internalize. It sounds like they would also be more receptive to information as it's being said, if they have confidence that both of you are are on the same trajectory. And uh, if you don't do that, also, they could just get really stressed out, um, not knowing where they're going to land. Indeed. And you can frame the conversation around it. So say you're uh, making a latte, you might not even do the full process or procedure that day. But if you show them the full piece and then say, hey, today we're going to work on the first two steps, then you've provided, again, them the context of what do I need to focus on and not getting overwhelmed. And depending on the person and the skill and their experience, you can make all kinds of different decisions on how you focus that time, but the context is really going to be helpful for them. And then I and I think helping s- slow it down and then getting to the key steps is really important. And this gets to something you said um, a few minutes ago, Chris, about wanting to tell them all the details and kind of impress people with how you do it and the way you've made the, the process more efficient. And people will get there faster if you make it simpler up front. So if you can get the procedure down to four or five key steps, that is going to help you to convey it to them with a lot more simplicity and it's going to allow them to latch onto it. So things like, uh, you know, you want to, first of all, think through like what those four or five steps are. This, this is by the way, and this is stepping back a little bit to the preparation stage, but this is something that's missed a lot of times by trainers, unless they've done it a lot, which is they will get that person with them and then they'll kind of think through as they're with the person, how they're going to explain it. And that's, I think a mistake. Most of the time we should have already thought through the five, four or five key steps. We're going to explain. We should already have all the materials set out. We should have, uh, whatever you need to be on the bar for, uh, for getting all the equipment done. 
that should all be done in advance. So you've thought through what are the key things you really need to communicate. And I think that that lessens the temptation then for us to add in a lot of color commentary of like, oh, you know, this step I do this way. And the reason I do this is because years ago I discovered if I did this and if I clean it, you know, like and, and, and it sounds funny, like even saying that loud. But we most of us do that. Like when we start training someone, we start adding in all this color commentary of all the things you could do and why you could do it this way and why you could do it that way. And we've lost people <laughs> most of the time. They're like, wow, I'm just doing this for the first time. And I'm totally overwhelmed here at step two because there's all this background information about this. And it's just not essential. That's maybe the good conversation to have, you know, 30 days from now or six months from now, once they're pretty good at the skill, then you can go into like, oh, here's why I do it this way. And here's how I tweaked it. And here's how I can be more efficient. But just keep it simple at the beginning. Get down to the key steps and avoid that, that too much of that commentary um, or background or how you do it or why you made the decision. They're just trying to internalize it for the first time. They don't need to know all those details. They'll get better at doing those details later if you keep it simple on the front end. So before we get to the next part here with Dave Stahoviak on mastering the art of training, I wanted to take a second and talk about our sponsor, Prima Coffee. Now, Prima is a specialty coffee equipment supplier based out of Louisville, Kentucky, And from the very beginning, they have set out to make the best coffee brewing equipment available to the general public. Their focus is on curating the best equipment for every need, from grinders to espresso machines to undercounter fridges, uh, all sorts of small wares. I mean, they have everything you need or can think of, really. And they put a big emphasis also on having the expertise to help their customers get the right gear to fit every situation. When you visit their website now, you can use the promo code KEYS10, that's K-E-Y-S-10, when you go to prima-coffee.com. And what that'll do is it'll give you $10 off any purchase over $75. Some restrictions do apply. So be sure when you go to prima-coffee.com, when you check out, use the promo code for this show, that's KEYS10, and that'll give you that $10 off of your purchase. And uh, I know you're going to really enjoy your experience with these guys over at Prima. And thank you, Prima, for your sponsorship and support of Keys to the Shop. Really appreciate it. So now let's get back to our show with Dave Stahoviak talking about mastering the art of training. So simple on the front end and then branch out from there. And definitely you're going to have to pay attention to, you know, how um, they are growing in their understanding And uh, as you demonstrate what done looks like or what success looks like to the individual, as you branch out and you're teaching the components step by step, you know, you've got them in order now. You were started simple. Now they're understanding the complex as well as the simple. So as you're doing this, what are you looking for as the trainer? So you're watching this person. You're seeing that they're going step by step. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Sometimes when I was uh, training people, there was times when I was just like maybe a little impatient and I didn't know what I should be looking for as they were making a mistake. How can we be proactive while we're in this process of uh, helping people get to a functional level of competency? This is where the one thing at a time really helps because if you watch someone do something for the first time, and of course you want them to do it. So once you've demonstrated it and you've walked through a couple of times, then you want to hand it over to them so they can actually do it. Um, they can't do it if you're doing the work. So they need to step in and actually try it. And the first time they do that, you're going to see 28 things that they are doing that are not working for them. <laughs> and Exactly 28. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> not 29 or 27. Exactly 28. And, and the temptation is to start jumping in on all of those. And that's where um, you have to make a decision in the moment as a trainer of what is the one thing that's most important for them to correct first. So this is where the one at a time is really helpful. So zero in on one thing, maybe two, that they can tweak and do better. Help them get better at doing that and repeat it until they've got that skill down. Then move on to the other ones later. Um, Don't try to give someone feedback on 20 some things all at once. Um, You wanna stop them, you know, stop them in the moment, say "Here, here, try this differently. And, you know, set the other things aside for a while. Maybe you write it down. Maybe you keep a mental list, whatever you do. Um, but but resist the temptation and go after everything right away. Because um, there is nothing more uncomfortable 
than when you're doing something for the first time or one of the first few times and there's someone next to you telling you all the things you're doing wrong. It just, it lowers your motivation, your engagement and your confidence level. Um, what you want to be doing is also finding the things people are doing well. And I read a book years ago, Chris, it was required reading in my first job. It was a book by Jim Thompson called Positive Coaching. And it's a book about how to coach kids sports teams. But we would use it um, in working as educators of working with kids in tutoring. And one of the central messages of the book is 75% positive reinforcement, 25% corrective criticism. And I try to generally utilize that ratio, even when I'm working with adults and coaching and training, is I want to reinforce the things they're doing well, and I want to give them positive feedback so they see the things they're doing well, so it builds their confidence up. And then at the same time, I want to zero in on the one thing or maybe two things that I see right away that they can improve upon. So that way they see that they're having success. It starts to build their confidence level. And at the same time, they're developing skill by correcting that one or two things that might be holding them back from being as effective right away. I love that. That it makes a lot of sense, especially when you think about you would want that for yourself, too, if you were in that situation. Back to the uh, the empathy standpoint. And uh, we've kind of naturally gone into the direction of, of the third thing that we need to be able to uh, master as a trainer. We started by just being prepared, uh, preparing ourselves for what lies ahead and then demonstrating properly, starting with the end goal first and then branching out into the step by steps. But then after everything is is done, what we're talking about right now is is debriefing people properly. Um, part of that is asking good questions. And what sort of questions should we be asking people when we're at the table thinking about like, let's talk about what you did on the bar. One of my favorite books right now, Chris, is a book called The Coaching Habit by Michael Bungay Stanier. I think it's a book every leader should have on their bookshelf. And um, Michael does a brilliant job of teaching us all as leaders how to be coaches through seven really simple, clear questions. And I think two of them are really, really helpful when you're training someone for the first time. One of the questions he calls the focus question, which is what's the real challenge here for you? And that's a question I think could be really helpful in a situation like this, because often if something isn't working, especially in the debrief, if something's not working, the person who's learning it is, is as aware of it as you are. And in fact, perhaps more so they're feeling the pain. They're feeling like it's not happening. They've seen you do the skill or the process and they're not, they're running up against a, a wall of uh, trying to implement it. And part of what that question allows us to do is kind of help that person zero in on what's really the big challenge. Because if you know that and they know that, and you guys have clarity on that, then you can work on that together to get better at it. And then, one of the other questions I love uh, from Michael's book is a question he calls the lazy question, which is how can I help? What can I do to support you at getting better at this? And that's, I think, a really helpful question to ask because you're putting the responsibility back on them to tell you what they need that will support them in being more effective. Um, and, and that's why it's called the lazy question, by the way. It's not you doing the work. It's them doing the work. Um, but then it also gives them a chance to coach you on what you can do to help. And then you can decide if that's something you can help with or what's the best resource for them, or maybe it's something they can do for themselves. So I think those two questions are really helpful when you're doing the debrief of, you know, how can I help you to make this better? What's the real challenge for you? Those will, uh, those will go a long way at generating some conversation that then takes you to the next step. I really love those questions. And I'm sure there are a lot of other questions, you know, I love uh, Michael Bungay Stanier's, um, uh, what is it, his Great Work podcast is a, is a good uh, resource. And I've heard him on your show a couple of times, right? He's been on the Coaching for Leaders. He has. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, so anyone, uh, you know, as we are here, people should definitely uh, look up those episodes where he's been on Coaching for Leaders and, you know, learn more about that. But when we're debriefing people, which is so important, you know, um, as a trainer, and we just got off of a season of competition in the coffee industry where, you know, there are a bunch of judges tasting your coffee and watching you make coffee. One of the things that we talk about is you always want to talk to your judges about what they saw and be receptive to that feedback. The next step, the next kind of pillar of a great uh, trainer, you have to coach people. 
and you kind of have to bring them into the workplace at some point, <laughs> kick them out of the nest in a way. But there's a proper way to do that. I mean, you're not going to just fly perfectly right away. Um, some people like to do trial by fire, but uh, you say that we should really focus on giving people small wins. Why is that? It's the best way I know to build confidence and to build skill and to change behavior. And it's like, it's like training to, to run a marathon, which I did years and years ago. Uh, no one who was in their right mind, at least would think about, uh, you know, sitting around for waiting for their marathon. And then the, you know, the week before the marathon run the couple hundred miles that they needed to run for the training that they should have been doing over the last three to four months, um, and then go run a marathon. Uh, no one does it that way. Of course, what we do is we start off by running a couple of miles, uh, a few months out. And then, you know, as you get a few, you know, a week sooner to the marathon, then you run an extra mile and then you get up to eight to 10 miles and then eventually you get to 12 to 15 miles. And as you get closer and closer to the date, you continue to increase your mileage because the human body physiologically won't respond that fast if you try to just throw everything at it in the same way. And our, our brains aren't that much different as far as behavior and what we can take on. We can only learn so much so quickly at once. And every person's a little bit different, of course, but um, creating the opportunity to have small wins is huge on so many things. Creating new habits. There's a bunch of books out uh, on this right now. Um, the uh, oh, I'm, I'm blanking on the book by Charles Duhigg, The Power of Habit, I think it's called right now, is out. Uh, and it, it, the lesson is, you know, have small wins, have things that you know you can change your behavior on, get good at doing that, and then push to do something bigger. And that that mindset is going to be the thing that's going to most likely get people to the larger goal, the long term goal. If you start and focus on those the small wins. And I learned this years ago as a Carnegie instructor for Dale Carnegie is Dale Carnegie was brilliant when he put together his training program 100 years ago on helping people to improve their communication and leadership and public speaking skills is his whole training process. The whole training process of the company is still built around small wins of getting people to experience success in a classroom setting and then to come back the next week or to the next session and to do something a little bit harder and experience success with it. And once you start experiencing success and you get the momentum going, you're so much more likely to proceed and continue to go forward. But if you hit a wall right away, that's where you lose the motivation and you lose the engagement. On the bar, it can be kind of a pressure cooker. And I, I know I mentioned just a second ago that there's this trial by fire thing uh, that we do where we put somebody on a shift and, and we end up kind of barking orders at them because they're <laughs> they're messing up a lot of things that really is our fault for putting them in that situation. Um, but even in the most um, safe situation on the bar, when you're serving people in, a, in the service industry, you never know what people are going to give you in terms of challenges when you're serving the public. And so it, it, it would be helpful to know what the difference is between like when you're on the bar with somebody, what, how should you be coaching them? What does coaching look like specifically versus just kind of saying, do this, don't do that. No, don't put that there. Things like that. Well, to your first point, if you can be smart about it, I think that helps. And, and not every, not every establishment's going to be able to do this in, in your industry, Chris. Of course, there's some establishments where you have a place you can go and do a training bar and you can be outside of the public sphere a bit and learn some of the basic skills. Not every that's not always possible. It's not always possible to not have someone new who's working the morning rush. Right. So uh, if it's possible and you can put someone in a situation where they're going to experience more success and there's not a lot of uh, demands on them learning new things all at once and, you know, kind of throwing them into the fire. I think that generally is probably the better way to go. But you know, when it's not, it's not. So that's where it comes back to meeting people where they are. Um, if you can really take time to appreciate where someone's coming from and then focus on doing one or two things better, that can really help a lot. And if sometimes it's not always possible to do, but to the extent we can do that, I think that that's huge. And my friend, Tom Henschel uh, has been on uh, the show before he's a uh, he has the Look and Sound of Leadership podcast, which is a really masterful podcast on coaching and um, teaching people. And in one of the analogies he uses is with coaching, 
he told a story when he was on the, my show a while back of uh, how him and his daughter went hiking one day. And they were hiking along this trail. And when you look to the left, you saw the Pacific Ocean and the beach. And you saw how beautiful the, the coastline looked. And when you look to the right, it was a dense forest. And his daughter made the point to him. She said, Dad, you know, imagine if someone was just looking in this direction and hadn't seen the other side, how it would look like an entirely different experience. And Tom uses that story as an analogy for coaching is a lot of times we're looking at the forest and the person we're coaching is looking at the ocean. We're in the same location, but we're seeing something entirely different. And what most of us try to do as leaders and coaches, at least initially, is we try to tap that person on the shoulder and say, come over here and look at the trees. (laughs) Look at the trees you do not see right now because you're looking the wrong way. (laughs) <laughs> and what Tom challenged me and, and a lot of us in our community to do is, is to change our mindset on that, is to, instead of trying to get the person to come around and look at the trees, is to first face the same direction they're looking and see the ocean that they're looking at and understand where they're coming from and appreciate what they're seeing and the perspective they're bringing and meeting them there first. And then once you've met them there, once you're talking at the same level, once you're having the same conversation and you've learned about what their experience is and how they see the world a bit and the biases they bring to doing this or the challenges that they, they may be running into that are unique to them, then you can kind of gently tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, you know, there's this great ocean here, but did you, did you look behind you? Let, let's look together. Just take a peek at what's there. And, and if you do that genuinely, you earn the right as a leader to move people gradually in the direction that's going to serve both of you and the organization. And so I think about that a lot as I'm coaching and to get to your question specifically, Chris, which is in the moment, how do you do that during a rush when someone's been thrown through the wolves and all chaos is breaking loose is to try to meet them where they are. Take 10 seconds if you can and really look at things from their perspective. Like Dale Carnegie said a hundred years ago, try honestly to see things from the other person's point of view. How is this person framing the situation right now? What are they struggling with? What's the one thing that I could coach them on right now that will give them some help? There may be 30 things that are happening that they're dropping right now, but what's the one thing that if I help them to get better on will help them to have a little more success in this moment? And then you you handle the other 29 later. Um, But that in that moment gives them some confidence, some success. You're meeting them where they are and you're gently encouraging them to look at things from a little different perspective. Now the shift is over. Smoke has settled or dust has settled from the shift. You've, you've coached them through this uh, whole thing and you've got history with them because you've taken them through some training before and now they've just done it live. And maybe they're thinking about how badly they screwed up (laughs) or, you know, that's usually what's happening. Sometimes people are just like, man, I really aced that. And we're thinking, well, no, you didn't. But, uh, the next phase for us as, as trainers Um, is to give people feedback. And uh, for us as professionals in any industry, feedback is really important. Um, What does feedback look like when it's the most effective after we've gone through all of these other processes? I think one of the things we can do that's really helpful, especially if it's been a situation where someone is feeling pretty beaten up and they know that they didn't do a lot of things well, or maybe they ran into a rush and it just, a lot of mistakes happen is I think one of the things we can do as leaders is to um, talk about our mistakes before we spend time starting to criticize them. And so one thing that I often will try to do is when I'm coaching someone on something for the first time, or maybe I'm training them on a skill set, and there's something that they mess up or something that becomes obvious that they missed or someone complains about something, is I'll often try to think back in my experience, what's a time that I messed up something similar? What's a time that I had um, a similar issue come up? What's a time that I made an assumption about this that wasn't true? What's a time that maybe I thought I knocked it out of the park and it turned out I didn't? (laughs) And so, um, and then tell that story first. So I, I start that conversation by saying, you know, I I saw what happened today. I just wanted to share with you something that happened to me a while ago. And you then as a 
trainer, leader, insert appropriate uh, noun here, right? Is you humanize yourself and you position yourself as someone who is, is, is saying to them, hey, I get it. I've been there. I've struggled with this too. I'm a human being too. <laughs> and, and then it's a lot easier for that person to then connect with us and get coaching from us and to take feedback from us as far as what we need to change or we need to correct. So I don't even think it's so much the feedback. Yeah, give feedback, of course, correct. Help people to do things better. But start off with the, I'm in this with you. I've been there. Because no one wants to be led by someone who appears perfect or who appears like they've got everything figured out and has never made a mistake. I mean, if most of us think back to the people that we've had in our working lives that have been some of the best leaders, they're not people that appeared perfect. They're not people that um, had everything figured out. They're people that were willing to be vulnerable. They're people that were willing to talk about their mistakes. They're people that made us feel um, okay when we, we mess something up. And so I think if we can start with talking about some of the own, our challenges we've run into in the past and situations we've had to navigate and places we've messed up, I think that really helps people to then have permission to engage with us and to say, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm there with you. Let's talk about how we make this better. And then I think the feedback's a lot easier conversation. And I imagine also positive reinforcement because not everything they did is going to be bad. Indeed. Yeah. So that's where that positive, that 75% positive comes in, in the debrief. And a lot of people who are high performers get really, really, um, get really hard on themselves. And they've got a list of 40 things that they really messed up and they haven't even really thought much about what they did well. And that's where you can often provide the perspective of, you you might say, yeah, you know, there are things that didn't work here and let's talk about them. And, uh, not instead of, but, and, there's also a bunch of things that worked really well. Here's what you did well here. And, and of course, genuinely, you know, finding the things that they did do well, that helps them to then see that you're seeing the big picture. So we were talking about big picture earlier. What's the outcome that you want? The outcome you want for them too, is you're not just getting caught up in valuing them as an employee and their worth as an employee in the last interaction they had where they messed up something. You're looking at the big picture of, yeah, that didn't go well. And also, here's a bunch of things that did go well today. So they come back with a much more objective view of their own development. And that not only is good for them, but it's going to be good for you and them when they go on to train someone in the future, because they will then do the same thing for the next person. And you set a standard in your organization of we care about each other. We treat each other like human beings. We're okay when we, it's okay when we make mistakes. Yes, let's fix them. Let's fix them as quickly as we can. Um, but we, we have open, honest communication about those things. I think it's a wonderful place to start from. Man, these five keys are just so critical. And in review, we are entering into this training role, preparing ourselves to, you know, step back, empathize, take time uh, necessary to train people well. We're demonstrating with the kind of the organizational goal in mind, like what is done look like? What it, what are we? What's the goal for for us here at this business? And let me demonstrate that for you, and then get into the details. And you know, the third thing that we have to do is evaluate uh, what happened as they practice things and kind of debrief and and repeat. You know, do it over and over again. Um, and then we coach people live, which is always the scariest part, but is a great opportunity for building rapport. And then the fifth and final thing we just got discussing is, is giving feedback, you know, employing that 75% positive, uh, 25%, uh, critical. And, uh, I would say formational, uh, information to them in, in all of that, just saying it thing, if we apply it, we're going to be producing some really great uh, contributors, uh, in the business, you know, the great baristas that are going to add value to the company. Now we, as trainers though, we don't get to go through that phase for our job. So what can we do to better ourselves in lieu of being able to go through these uh, five steps? Well, it's the same thing we're talking about to do for others is to take one thing at a time. So listening to this conversation today, and hopefully folks will go look at the show notes, Chris, and, and look at some of the details, the things we've discussed, is not to try to do all of these all at once. So the next time you're going to be 
doing a training session with someone or you're giving coaching or feedback, pick one thing out of this conversation today and try it and do that. And, and then do a check-in with yourself at the end, you know, how successful were you were, were you at doing that and implementing that? Maybe it was identifying the key steps before you actually begin doing the demonstration. Maybe it's doing the demonstration first and you haven't done that before. Maybe it is finding, um, three times as many positive things to say as one thing you would say that's critical. Maybe it's asking the, how can I help question? Don't try to do that all at once to the same advice we're, you know, we're coaching our employees on is pick one of those to try, implement that, use it a few times. And then as you get good at it, then find something else to change or to tweak. And I think that that's a really good professional development plan for all of us. I I love the quote that's commonly attributed to Eleanor Roosevelt. I'm not sure if she actually said it or not, but, uh, it's the, um, a great, you know, do one thing every day that scares you. I think it's a really good professional development plan is find something that you're not comfortable with doing around this that we've talked about today. Try that. It's going to be a little scary the first time you do it, or at least uncomfortable. And then when it's comfortable and you feel like it's going well for you, then try something else. And if you try something and it's not working for you, try it a different way, or maybe you set that aside and say, Hey, this doesn't work for me. Uh, and that's okay. Try something else that does work and watch for the results that you get. And then you move on to the next thing. Great. So th- this is just, Dave, been a really a great time uh, just listening to what you're talking about. It, I'm definitely going to be trying to uh, find out where I can apply these things in, in my role. How can we in the uh, Keys to the Shop community reach out to you and, and find more, uh, find out more about your work? Oh, thanks, Chris. I think the best way that folks can get value from the work I'm doing is just go over to coachingforleaders.com or search for Coaching for Leaders on whatever podcast uh, app you're using to listen to Chris's show. And there's a lot of information on the podcast episodes that'll be helpful to folks. And for those who want to, there's a free membership you can set up on the coachingforleaders.com website. And when you set it up, uh, you'll get access to two things that will help a lot. One of them is the full podcast library from the last six years, and you can search by topic. One of the topics is training. And there's a number of episodes that I've aired with experts over the years on how to train people. So that's an easy way to get access there to a bunch of different content on this. Um, And then the other thing you get access to right away is my 10 day audio course that's free um, on 10 ways to empower the people you lead. And it's a really um, it's a really condensed version of some of the key lessons that I've aired on the podcast over the last five, six years. And some of the key things I think leaders can really tap into, uh, especially first time leaders that will help them to be a lot more effective at empowering others. And that's huge, obviously, in the coaching and training process. So all that's at coachingforleaders.com. Wow. So (laughs) that's, that's a lot. And so I, I encourage everyone listening, definitely go there. Uh, if not, as soon as you uh, stop listening to this episode, just ASAP, definitely check that out. And, uh, Dave Stohoviak, of coaching for leaders. Thank you so much for your insights again. And, uh, I think that you've just made good on your uh, motto, you know, leaders aren't born, they're made. And I think you've, you've helped make us all just a little bit better as leaders. Well, thanks, Chris. I really appreciate that. And, uh, like, like you and so many of your community, I've struggled through so many of these things myself over the years and still do. And I'm, learning right along with my community. And it's a, it's an honor to, to be able to help in a small way. I'm uh, looking forward to seeing what comes out of this conversation today. Well, thank you so much, Dave, for your time, for your wisdom, for your insights. Uh, really enjoy the conversation. And as somebody who was put into a training position because I was good at my job, I really, really appreciate learning more about teaching, about training, because I wasn't really so great at the whole communication part. I was a little bit micromanagey. I was a little bit dictatorial, you know, feeling out different things. And a framework like this, I know, uh, will be really helpful for those who are in that situation. And even if you're really good at communication and education, this is a great supplement to what you already know. And I feel that over the course of the conversation, what emerged as a theme is taking uh, a measured advance in terms of how we approach each person. You know, each person is going to be different. Not every barista is going to respond to these things the same way. So as a leader, we always live with this tension 
where we find a method that is supposed to work well. I would say that what we talked about today is, is like one of those methods. But then we teach it to a person on the bar or in the training lab, and it doesn't really take. And so it can frustrate us. It certainly has me in the past where I thought, man, this is just time-tested wisdom and it's not working. Well, you know, that tension is basically the um, X factor of the human element of leadership. You don't know what a person holds within themselves that will resist the information or the method that you use in training them. And that's why we always have to be sensitive to sympathize, to empathize, to take measured advance as we apply these truths or these methods. So um, I, again, don't try all of these at once, but use them in a measured way. Don't try to just apply it as a cure-all for all the baristas and expect the results to just take right away. Uh, you'll be sorely disappointed. These things happen over time. But that said, I highly encourage you to uh, find ways to apply what we talked about today. So let me just reiterate, I really feel you should be listening to Coaching for Leaders podcast. It is a very useful uh, professional development podcast, and it's an inspiration to me and my work at Keys to the Shop for sure, and also just impactful in my career, and I, I just know it's going to be impactful for yours as well. If you like our show and you want to know more, you can go to keystotheshop.com, and there you will find the resources of the PDFs that you can download for each show, where the show notes are. And if you'd like, you can also go to iTunes and leave a review. It's super easy. Just go right to our Keys to the Shop page on iTunes, click on those stars, leave a rating, and leave a comment too. That's always helpful and fun uh, to hear how Keys to the Shop has positively impacted you and or your shop. And you can reach out to me too at chris at keys to the shop .com. That's my email if you have comments, questions, concerns, all of those things. So go on this week, think about how you can apply these things to your bar, and I hope that you become better and better at your job as a trainer. Certainly these tools will help you do that. And I also hope that this episode, along with all of our other episodes on the show, have given you keys to the shop.